Hey guys, it's Coco Dope back with another Dope Talk, a short podcast for hosting people with dope talents. Today we've got celebrated furry novelist and a longtime community member, Kyle Gold. You want to say hi, Kyle? Hi, Kyle. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. Um, yeah, that's me. I'm Kyle, a writer. I've been writing in the fandom for 12, 14 years, something like that. Yeah, and I've been a member of the fandom for... 26 years now i think 91 whatever 91 is to now it's, it's crazy how close-knit the community makes people because like i i uh before i got into the furry fan i've been doing art for like the last 10 years um i never had this much of an easy time i guess getting along with other artists or introducing myself because there was never really a sort of common thing like there's a lot of different fandoms and a lot of different stuff that you could do art for but it was never necessarily um, that easy to to connect with somebody like who who maybe did like a completely different kind of art compared to you. Like, but it, in the furry community, like I said, I've I've met so many people so fast, and all of them have been really awesome in one way or another. And you know, you have your assholes, but that's like not, not always the case. Well, yeah, which is super surprising. They're everywhere. But yeah, I know. I've I've been around a lot of artists in the fandom, and one of the really neat things is that the fans you know when fans come into the fandom you have a sketchbook and you go around you get artists to draw on it but most of the artists most of the artists that i know also have sketchbooks and like to go get sketches from other people who have different styles and a a lot of them just go wow you know this person does this thing and that's so cool like i can't do that and i want to learn how they do these tricks and everyone's really open about Oh, you want to know how I do the lighting on my characters? Yeah, 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 sure. Like, this is how I use these models, and I use this technique, and here's a book you might want to look at. And um, everyone's very eager to share, which is, which is really cool. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. So, speaking of artists, by the way, I I, uh, I wanted to point <laughs> out that you're actually very much a writer, and and that's that's kind of something you don't often see in the fandom, at least from my experience. Maybe there's a lot more that you're familiar with, but would you want to maybe expound on the uh, kind of writing that you do, or like maybe what you've been doing over the last ten years with that? So I I see a lot more writing in the fandom, and that's probably because I'm you know hip deep in that community there is a furry writers guild that has a couple hundred members at this point we have we support two small presses who both put out fair number of books a year and actually more than that are sporadically releasing things i generally work with uh sofa wolf press and fur planet but um but there's a bunch of others rabbit valley produces books um weasel uh thurston howell uh there's probably a couple others that I'm leaving out. I apologize, you guys. But um but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of publishing going on now too. But you're right, writing does proportionally rank probably behind art and fursuiting in uh, in the fandom. Which is kind of weird because it's like a very established medium that's been around almost pretty much as long as art has, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it has. But the the way that I look at it is kind of like everyone who comes into the fandom, I've I've likened it in the past to playing this gigantic MMO, but in real life. And everybody brings their own character and their own history and their own contribution to it. And so the very first thing that you want to do with that is, well, I want to see what my character looks like. Oh, yeah. And that's what uh, art provides and, that's and then a, maybe the wait, wait, what? oh and then i was going to say the next thing is maybe i want to dress up like my character and then that's fursuiting and then you sort of branch out from there and you say well when i'm not thinking about my own personal experience maybe i want to read about other experiences and other worlds and stories and then that's where the writing comes in yeah and it's it's kind of interesting like i've noticed uh when i was not doing furry stuff um with the commissions it was it was very low proportionally in the amount of money i would make off it but like suddenly in the furry fandom that whole point you made about wanting to see your character and and seeing them become something visual that's that's sort of why i think furry art sells so well especially for being in such a small niche environment yeah absolutely it's like cool that you you can also find other mediums to express it. Like there's a lot of furry musicians and like a lot of uh, furry like <laughs> suit dancers and all, all sorts of crazy stuff now. Like at, at conventions, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, and that's that's great too. I was going and I was going to say there's writing, there's dance, there are other crafts. There are a few people who do sculpture, um, and and all of that. The one of the neat things about furry is it's very uh, DIY almost. Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's so open to new ideas that you can have someone just say, Hey, I wonder what would happen if, for example, um, I printed up a whole bunch of these badges that were just, you know, generic Fox, generic wolf or generic profession or generic something. And I just pre-printed them up and sold them off my table for five bucks. And I think Mary Mouse was the first one to do that, and they became amazingly popular, and now a bunch of people are doing them. And it's just that kind of community where you can say, I want to try something and see if it works. And you can totally do that. I mean, like, there's, there's just people finding new niches to, like, explore their own talents. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm an artist, but suddenly I'm doing a podcast, and that's actually going <laughs> places. So it's kind of cool how that works if you, if you know the right people and you have the right, like, talent and intention with it. Um, I was I was going to talk about how I guess more more elaborating on your own personal writing because because what you do is right. is very much like I, I don't want to say romance novels consistently I've 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 actually been delving into one of them but uh, you want you want to kind of explain what what kind of writing you do? Sure. I started off with gay romance and gay relationships, and that was because at the time and still kind of. There wasn't a lot of that out there, and I thought that that was an important thing. So there was a lot of there was a lot of gay, um, for lack of a better word, role playing or just fetish stories or just porn stories, and I use that word kind of lightly to refer to my own work as well. But I mean, literally, there were online archives with here's a story about a setting in which these two characters have sex. <laughs> and there was, this was in the early 2000s, there was kind of a thinking in the community that you couldn't have sex in a story and also have it be a serious story with a plot. That's, that's weird, man. And, yeah. And I have this kind of contrarian streak, which I think a lot of writers have and a lot of, furries have actually to be honest but when i hear stuff like that i say well i think you can do that all right i'm going to prove that you can do that so i had written a few um i'd written a couple porn stories to be honest i'd written a longer story that actually had plot to go along with the sex in the story and then i thought i bet that i can do a novel and it built off of the short story that I sold to Sofa Wolf Press for their first couple issues of Heat. It was serialized in one and two, but it became much more complicated. It became about balancing your life with your romance and relationships. And the more I started writing, the more I started realizing that there were these aspects, like all a lot of the gay romance books, even outside of Furry, um, are basically, here's how these two tortured people who are being told by society that they can't be gay and can't have a relationship manage to overcome those obstacles and fall in love with each other. And, you know, which is great. It's a great story. You have to have those stories. But there wasn't anything about... Um, and then here's what happens two years later when they're over the first flush of, hey, this is a new person I'm attracted to. And they're actually trying to make this relationship work in the context of family and work and society and community and all that. Yeah. And I became more interested in that. And that's where um, Waterways, which was my first real big popular novel, came from. And... After that, I wrote a short story that became three more short stories and then a novel and then four more novels. <laughs> um, and that was like the first book won uh, an award for a gay romance from a gay romance thing that was not furry, which was cool. 
And the next four didn't do as well in that um, in that award, even though I think they're better books in general. But it was because they're not about that romance. They're about the relationship. You're talking about the Out of Position series? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar a little bit. I was actually just listening to uh, the first one on Audible. <laughs> ah, Saverin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, he's, he's very interesting to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm impressed by the job he did, especially getting through all five of these books because they're not short books. No, it's it's like I think eleven hours of of recording. And the only reason I'm listening on Audible is just like I wanted to get into one of your books to kind of understand your work a bit more. But at the same time, I didn't have a whole lot of time to actually sit down and read, which I think is great that Audible no. does that. And and it's kind of interesting because yeah. he sort of brings a level of personality to the writing <laughs> that's yeah, that I find very no, absolutely. enjoyable. And that's what the Audible books are there for. I mean, for years, people bugged me about when I was going to get audiobooks done. And it wasn't until um, Amazon bought Audible and they set up this platform that allowed authors and narrators to connect and basically produce an audiobook for very little money. I mean, the deal, the deal with Savern and I is that we basically split the royalties on all the sales. Yeah. So... I didn't have to come up with several thousand dollars to pay someone to do a narration of my books. So I wanted to explore different aspects of gay relationships. I moved on after the out of position books kind of away from the whole falling in love thing and more towards here's some different aspects of life that are peripheral, but connected to being gay. Mostly I have gay main characters. Um, one of the books that I wrote recently has an asexual main character. Um, one of the books has a bisexual main character, but there's usually that element of, hey, my relationship isn't going to be what I see in the movies all the time. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of respect that people have for your work that's very like obvious. Like I, I post up the comments or I guess the question section for, for mm -hmm. people to ask in a lot of the stuff they wrote it was very much i really respect your work because it's helped me work through my own personal problems and it's like whoa <laughs> you know you don't you don't always see that with people in in the furry fandom especially with artists like you know there might be like a sort of i i can empathize with this but people really apparently empathize with your work which i i find very very uh touching in a way <laughs> yeah it's it's very cool it's one of the one of the things that I really, really value about the um, the furry fandom and, and my fans in particular. Um, you know, I get emails from people who are having trouble because they are going away to college for the first time or they're just out of college or they're trying to deal with parents or they're dealing with coworkers or they're dealing with the, these situations in which they're not sure about their own feelings and having like the characters in the books, people tell me feel real enough to them that they feel like they have a friend who's going through the same things. And, and I think that's really cool. Like that makes me, that makes me feel better than anything except when someone says your books inspired me to write my own stories, which is like my favorite compliment to get. <laughs> No, it's like, it's weird. So I, some of the stuff, I haven't gotten through your first book entirely, but like in the beginning, it was it was a little cheesy and saccharine with a lot of the writing you did. But I mm -hmm. started really empathizing with a lot of what the characters were feeling emotionally the more it went on. And I'm like, wow, I'm really invested in this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, like I'm getting like very empathetical towards uh, what's going on with like the characters and their relationship drama or like what's going on with their own personal stuff. And I don't, I really feel that a whole lot when I'm either enjoying like uh, media, whether it's TVs or movies or books, like it's, it's really hard to suck me in. So you've done something special you know, <laughs> that I've noticed. Well, thank you. A lot, with a lot of these themes, though, like, you know, about self-discovery and, like, you know, being being uh, more honest about who you are as a person to society, what really draws you into that kind of vibe, I guess? One of the, the thing kind of taking the, like, people becoming comfortable with their sexuality or becoming comfortable with their relationship, the, the next step in that is just people becoming comfortable with themselves, with who they are because that's 
that's something that in real life, I feel really sad when I see someone who says, man, I'd really like to do this thing, but I never had a chance. I never had the opportunity. I, I'm kind of scared. I would have to give all this up. And they're just, they're living like they have the potential to do all of these other cool things, but they can't force themselves to get over the hump. You know, my, my parents say it would be a waste of time or my significant other won't, uh, won't allow me to go out and do these things. And, you know, I just don't feel like it's really worth it to push, but you can tell that they do. And conversely, like one of my, uh, one of my good friends is an artist who goes by the name Don Ryu. I don't know if you've run into his art, but not, not familiar yet. Um, we, we, we met him through some friends and just talked to him about his, like how he came to learn art and get into art. And he said, you know, when I went into art school with my friends, I was like the least talented of the bunch, but oh, I was determined that I was going to be an artist. And I worked my butt off every day to do it. Most of my friends like dropped out. He's now, um, you know, he's, he's earning, earning a living as a furry artist. He's worked in, you know, storyboarding for, for actual television shows and so on. I think like that's, that's one of, that's the kind of story that makes me really happy because it's someone who just said, this is the thing that's going to make me happy. That's going to make me more me and I'm going to go do it. And they're doing it. My stories push people to say, you know, take that chance and at least try it. You don't, you can, you'd rather be the person who says, ah, I tried it and it didn't work out rather than, well, I never actually gave it a try. I had the same feeling, actually, when I went to college or university, not even a few years ago. Um, my my deal was I was surrounded by all of these incredibly talented artists. And that's kind of like what's going mm -hmm. on with me now in the fandom, even. Like, all these people I've met and suddenly I'm friends with them. It's like, you, you have this sort of drive to push yourself to be only better. Like, you know, when, when you, you're surrounded by people who are just seamlessly amazing you know it's like mm -hmm. yep <laughs> it's 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 hard but at the same time it's very encouraging like meeting tess was was a huge deal because they introduced me to so many people who are just like inspirational and incredibly useful when it comes to like learning about new things whether it's selling art or um doing art or, or even just like being a better person like socially it's it's a really good environment to, to stick yourself into that. So I think it's great when you find those sorts of people who push you to be just a better person and a better creator in general. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I try to, I try to tell people like, or, and my books try to tell people too, that it's not just, Hey, come to terms with who you are and what kind of relationship you want to be in, but you know, come to terms with who you are as a person and go do the thing that makes you happy as a person, because it's, too short not to when it comes to your writing what what kind of inspired you to get into a lot of these themes like i, I guess i already asked that um <laughs> you know see that's what i said like, a lot of these i don't know it was what? i wrote the kind i wrote the kinds of things that i wanted to see stories about that no one that no one else was writing in the way that i wanted to write them i'm going through uh waterways again because we're doing a 10th anniversary edition this december um, it, it came out in 2008, so it's hard to believe it's been 10 years, but I'm going back through it to just kind of, you know, clean up some of the 10 year old prose. And honestly, I don't, I'm not making that many big changes to it, but you know, I got to the end of it and I'm reading some of the stuff that I wrote 10 years ago and I'm like, wow, this is still like, this still gets to me. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it was, it, it's really interesting when you look back at your older content and you don't feel a lot of disdain for the sort of mistakes that you've made. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's also just like who you were at the time is very different from who you are now. You know, do, do you ever feel like weird looking at some of your older work? There's, there's definitely a line. And I think it's in the book Bridges that I wrote where the first three stories are just on the far side of that line and the last three stories are more recent. And when I read that as a whole, I look at the early stuff and I'm like, 
uh, this is the work of someone who spent a lot of time reading all those online stories and is just kind of doing his own version of the online stories. <laughs> and then the last three are like, oh, and this is someone who's doing, you know, stretching it and doing more interesting things and the, the prose is better. And because they, I think the last three were written like a year or two later than the first three. So um, that's, that's always the book that I point to when, um, when I think about that line where like before the line, it's kind of embarrassing. And after the line, it's, um, it's not so much. And yeah. if you, if you listen to the audiobook of that one, by the way, I read that one. So what would you say that kind of experience felt like reading your own work and trying to put a personality and sort of a uh, voice behind it? Uh, it was very thirsty. I went through like six bottles of water. Um, <laughs> no, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I discovered that I'm, I, I think I'm a pretty good reader. Um, I'm maybe not as good at voice acting because I would try to keep doing the consistent kind of voice for the different characters. And then I would realize like an hour later as I'm doing a different scene with these characters, I'm like, wait, I'm doing something a little differently this time. And I just couldn't keep it in my head the way that a good voice actor would be able to say, well, this character has this personality and every time they talk, this is the voice. And <laughs> I just, I just kind of make my voice like a little bit higher or a little bit softer or a little bit lower or whatever. And, and then sometimes it's not consistent between the characters. So I don't know. I think, I think that I read pretty well and especially my own prose because I know what the cadences are supposed to be and I can hit them better but it's i'm i'm not as good a voice actor which that's that's not honestly a problem i think i think it's like weird when you're recreating something because i've had to do a lot of scratch tracks for like the animations or stuff i work on and it's mm -hmm. super awkward because you have to like kind of put that sort of emotion behind it otherwise the conveyance of the idea is is like bad and like especially when you got to pitch it to your friends or in your case you're pitching it to literally anybody who's listening to it on uh right. like the audio service it's like oh now they gotta know how exactly I, I i feel about this and it's it's a very awkward situation but it's it's cool that you felt comfortable like expressing your own ideas and maybe even getting into character kind of like the way uh the guy who did out of position was because he kept a very consistent tone with their voices and i feel like that added just a little bit more uh humor and almost uh personality to the novel in, in its own sense yeah for sure um, yeah, there is a bit towards the very end of Bridges, towards like the emotional climactic end parts of it, um, where I get a little bit choked up as I'm reading it. So oh. anyone anyone listening can hear that because um, we didn't I didn't do multiple takes. Um, I, I was working with a director and he was like, he was like, I think that's good. Like getting the emotion in there is good. So we'll keep it. I said, all right. That's that's really sweet. I want to say one thing real quick because you were talking about inspirations. Uh, one of my favorite living writers just got the Nobel Prize in Literature a couple days ago, so I was very excited about that. He'll he'll never listen to this, but shout out to Kazu Ishiguro, well deserved. I have uh, um, probably all of his books. Maybe I mean I have most of them and have read them, and just I love some of the things he's done and have tried to steal some of his narrative tricks but he does just some amazing things with ex just the experience of being a person really comes across in his books no i mean this is something i've brought up on earlier uh, dope talks but i guess when it comes to being inspired by other creators is you shouldn't feel bad necessarily about i don't want to say taking content but taking notes on how to create content or like any kind of personal stuff, because when it comes down to it, you're building your own vocabulary. You know, you're, uh, you're creating a sort of idea on how to set your own content up. And if you're not doing it like word for word verbatim, it's, it's not a super big deal, especially if I think you end up creating something really brilliant of your own. No, absolutely. And I, I tell people that too, that people are always like, how do I come up with my own writing style? Like you, read a lot of other people and you pick the things that they do that you like and you do those things in your work <laughs> and 10 out of 10 that's what i do every day as an artist i, I find styles i love and I, I try to bring bits and pieces of them into my own work and the, the big thing you just don't want to do is copy someone's style like 
one on one and suddenly there's really no difference between, you know, you and that person besides the fact that you're a knockoff. <laughs> right, exactly. So, don't plagiarize. Don't. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing, very bad thing. <laughs> so the the thing that really interests me between like I guess people like you and Tess uh, is is the fact that you've been around for so long. So it's, I guess getting into the fandom must have been a very different thing for you in that sense, because it wasn't as established or there wasn't a lot of good media surrounding it. Uh, no, that's true. And as as evidenced kind of by the fact that, as I, as I mentioned, it took me 10 or 11, well, 10 years maybe to start really um, producing my own media. Uh, it was so I've um, I was a fan of this show called Tiny Toon Adventures oh. way back in the day. <laughs> um, it's we were just talking about it recently. How uh, a friend of mine got me the DVDs and like the first season, and I tried to watch a few episodes, and I'm like, oh god, it doesn't hold up. I feel <laughs> terrible, but I feel like some of the best episodes might hold up, but like. The first few that I was watching, I was just like, oh, no. Back in the day, I was 20, 27 years ago, I was very into it. And I was there was a Usenet group, which for, for you young listeners, um, that was what we did on the internet before uh, web browsers. The So the Usenet group was very active. It was basically like a big forum or online mailing list. And somebody at one point, and I have actually forgotten who it was on that group said, Hey, if you like these cartoons, you should check out this online thing called furry muck. And I said, what's a muck. And they're like, it's just like an online thing. Like at the time there was a thing called a mud, which was a multi-user dungeon, which was kind of like a multi-user text adventure. And the muck was like that, except without the adventure, you just showed up and, and I was, I would basically was given no guidance except, here's the program you use. Here's the, I think we just used like a telnet connection and back in the day, and like, here's the address. And oh, it was so ghetto. It was like, you know, all little text windows on your, um, on your computer. And I basically showed up and it said, well, here, like create your character description. And I was like, what character description? Uh, I should also add that I saw Disney's Robin Hood at a young, impressionable age, and I had the the record, like the vinyl record of the storybook of the film, and I played it over and over so much that years and years and years later, when the um, movie came out on video for the first time, we rented it and watched it, and I was watching it going... I know half these lines by heart and I don't like, I haven't thought of them in, in a decade and I'm still here just going like, <laughs> hiss, you deliberately dodged. <laughs> yes. I know exactly that. I know the cadence and the accent and everything. Yes. I hope you know you've, you've continued the tradition. I've had every episode. Someone mentions an old Disney film. It's it's, really it's hard not to do in the fandom, right? Yeah, because it's such a prominent part of it. For a lot of people, their childhoods were just these these Disney films, and like I I grew up on it, like The Fox and the Hound, Robin Hood. I, I didn't really like The Lion King like everybody did, but like all of this stuff, like Disney's classic Anthro, and for people to say that that furry stuff has only been around for a short time, I kind of highly disagree. Because like look at the Looney Tunes, look at old Disney films, look at like even. 19 like 20s 1930s there's like stuff like felix cat it's it's furry stuff mm -hmm. been around for a while it's just had a different name <laughs> yeah absolutely and fox and the hound by the way is one of my other favorite movies and one of the reasons that i love it is because it hits the theme of friendship so well i mean you know that's that's what it's about absolutely but most of the other disney movies have some kind of romance element to them um and this one was just like, hey, when you have a really good friend, these are the kinds of things that you that you do for them and that you shouldn't do and so on. And um, I took a I took a friend of mine who was very not into Disney movies like he was a big comics fan and read Wolverine and, and he was like, yeah, Wolverine's the best and so on. And I was like, and Fox and the Hound got re-released um, at some point when we were hanging out. And I said, Oh, uh, this is like 
I love this movie. We should go see it. And he's like, all right, I'll go see it. And he came out at the end and was like, well, that was really good. And I'm <laughs> not crying or anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, uh, that's, that's such a sad, but I mean like that, that gets to the whole point of you talking about like storytelling and, and relating it on, on a very like empathetical level with, with the characters, like something as simple as the Fox and the hand, which relates to friendships can relate to something that's more like complex, like a romance, especially a gay mm-hmm. one, that, you know, cause like Fox and the hand had the same theme of they're not supposed to be friends for a very specific reason, because they're two very different people and societal norms would, would tell them no, you know? Right. Right. And, and just the, the simple message of like, look, if you're friends with someone and a bunch of people are telling you for some stupid reason that you shouldn't be friends, don't listen to them. <laughs> Absolutely. A hundred percent. Since, since you've been involved in the community for a while, I guess I wanted to ask like how that might've changed for you over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, so I've gotten a lot more convinced and uh, motivated to go ahead and do things that I would like to see happen. Mostly in, you know, the last decade, 10, 15 years, it's been, hey, I want to see, I want to see this story written, or I want to see this book written, and then I write it, and I don't have to do more than that. And that's a known process now. Working with some of the people in the Furry Writers Guild that I mentioned, and talking about, I don't know, one of the things we're talking about is building better connections with the science fiction writers because there's there's some overlap there's not there's not a huge overlap definitely i think the communities need to be distinct but i also think that they could be closer than they are and so we're one of the things we're talking about is you know how do we how do we build those bridges so to speak and we're going out and doing it um we had a twitter conversation about three-ish years ago um, in which me and a couple writers and a couple editors said, hey, we'd like to have a writing workshop like kind of along the lines of um, the Clarion Writing Workshop, which is a six-week residential workshop for science fiction and fantasy writers. Uh, We'd like to have something like that for furry fandom because, um, you know, I went to Clarion, a couple of my friends have also gone and it's just been this great experience. And so we said, well, let's just start one. Let's make it happen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we've, we've done, we have a workshop called RAR, R-A-W-R, and we've run, run that for the last two years. It's a residential anthropomorphic writers retreat, I think is the, is the backronym to that. And yeah, so it was one of those deals where, I had said, I'd been saying for a couple of years, man, it would be cool if we had a a workshop. And I'm now at the point where I believe that, you know, we can, we can make these things happen. If you've been posting content for a while, you have a sort of force behind you when you know enough people and you, you you have enough names to kind of back yourself as your own independent thing. Cause for a while, like my, my thoughts uh, were I, if I'm not doing something inside of the animation industry, which is where I work, um, it's it's not official. It's not something that's going to be like noticed or anything that's going to have any sort of a following. But the second I started doing this podcast, it became something like, wow, I actually can get my own sort of thing going with it. Like I, I have people interested in it. I have people getting onto the project and treating it with like that same kind of respect I would expect from like an actual like uh, industry. Uh, you know, you can motivate your own projects is, is what I'm saying. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's what, you know, it's, as I was saying, this is something that everybody in the community comes to. And the more people are doing it, the more other people see that it can be done and also go ahead and do it themselves. I just want people to realize yeah. that. Oh, uh, we talk, one of the things we talk about is that, you know, a lot of other fandoms, the way furry's different is Star Wars has canonical source material and star trek has canonical source material and game of thrones has canonical source material and all these fans create their own work but it's always kind of got these huge massive you know stars for lack of a better word at the center of their orbit and furry is much more like a 
cloud of comets, I guess, if you will, than a solar system where each one of us is just creating all of our own things and we're just whirling around each other. And um, like I, I've, I've got furry books that I enjoy and, um, of course, you know, tons of artists and uh, admire a lot of music and even some of the short films people have done have been really cool. And I wander around conventions with the camera taking pictures of fursuits just like everyone else. So <laughs> It's fun, you know. We are we are our own source material. Yeah, I was I was gonna say the actual word I was thinking of was uh, you're your own agency, and I, I think that's that's brilliant. <laughs> agency. Speaking of that topic, I was actually gonna <laughs> get get more about your <laughs> your career as a published author. So, what would you say, like, if, if you want to kind of go over how it started, and then like bring it more into like where you're at right now, and maybe like how that how that's expanded, and how you've gotten into other projects. Like, what's what's kind of your story with that? I started <clears throat> I started writing short stories for my science fiction magazine um, in college, and then kind of once I got into the furry fandom, I started writing short stories for some of the furry zines. Eventually, you know, figured out that I can write novels, and had a couple novels that people really liked. What happened was like I was writing, and I was part of founding of Sofa Wolf Press. Uh, I had posted a story that I was working on up to some news group or another, and uh, Jeff, who currently runs Sofa Wolf, had seen it, and we had ended up talking about writing for a couple years. And then I was saying, you know, uh, the state of fanzines was in a weird place because there was one, the most reliable fanzine that was out at the time was Ed what we called aggressively G-rated fanzine. <laughs> um, there were other fanzines that would come out sporadically and, you know, one of them would take six months to respond to emails. And Jeff was very knowledgeable in the world of publishing and said, hey, this, you know, print on demand stuff is getting to the point where we can make professional looking magazines with it. And I think the furry fandom needs something like that. Um, so he started... Uh, he he and I started Sofa Wolf Press. He's really been um, the one making it run. I just provide occasional content for them. But uh, so I was working at the time in the tech industry. And hence, you know, I can that's how I ended up out in the Bay Area, California. <laughs> I was writing stories and books on the side until uh, about, I think it was, I think it was late 2010 that my um, company decided that they no longer needed my services, but they gave me a good severance package. And my husband said, Hey, if you're going to build your career as a writer, this is the opportunity to do it. So I've been writing full time since, um, December 2010, and um, I try to treat it as a job. I show up, sit down at my computer between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, sometimes 10, you know, if it's a lazy morning. Um, but, you know, I set myself deadlines. I say jokingly that my new boss is a jerk because I, <laughs> I'll take I'll take vacations to go do things, but I always bring the computer with me. And if I have a couple hours, then there's that voice in my head going, you could be using this time to write, you know, oh, no. you've got a bunch of things to do for people. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's really cool in that I get to do the thing that I love every day, all the time. And it's, it's also one of those things where I can't ever stop. Oh man. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little bit of a trade-off. I'll take it. I've been doing it for years now. I've been doing this for more years than I've had than I've held any other job. Uh, if I did not like it, then I would stop. <laughs> yeah. See, I've I found myself in a very similar position where I am I am not necessarily working in any uh, real jobs besides the stuff that I'm giving for myself. It's okay. it's hard because you really have to discipline yourself. And once you get into a zone of I need to constantly create content. 
suddenly you really can't separate you know relaxation time from uh the, the work you're actually doing and if you have that nagging feeling like oh i could be doing something or there's something i could be getting done you know whether it's uh, for business or personal, like just enjoyment of, of you know the hobby that you're doing, it's it's hard. You know? It you're, really is. You're losing sleep or like you're losing uh, time that you could be doing other stuff. Like I had a conversation with my dad not too long ago where he <laughs> he's like, "Hey, uh, Alex, what are you doing? Like, uh, what are you doing for fun?" And I'm like, "Fun." <laughs> <laughs> when's the last time i've been out i don't know but it's it's not a bad space to be in either because like when you have like your own creative control over over the time you spend on your art it, or, or any kind of content for the matter it's it's like suddenly i, I don't feel dread for the stuff that i'm doing because i've worked in a few uh big industry spots and sometimes i just don't feel like going in <laughs> <It's> like, yeah <laughs> no absolutely and i've i've never I've never, you know, walked down the hall and kind of looked at the office and been like, oh, I don't want to sit down at the computer today. I'm always, I'm always happy to go in and like, all right, just have to, you know, sometimes it's not the fun part of the job, like going through the manuscript. Every time I release a novel, one of the last things I do is I read the whole thing aloud to catch it, to catch proofreading stuff in it. Yeah. And it's it's so useful that I know I have to do it, but also I really don't look forward to those times. But <laughs> it's it's still like something where I go in and I'm like, well, I have to do this, and it's cool because as I once I get into it, I'm like, oh, uh, the process of reading it aloud is kind of painful. But now oh, I'm finding this paragraph and I fixed it, and it looks a lot better now. I used the word suddenly three times in two sentences. I have to get rid of all those and. And then it's better, and then I, then I feel good because I made something better. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's there's definitely certain parts I think I I don't enjoy the process. Like for me, editing is always a really zen time. But then doing all the art assets and then squeezing myself to like make sure everything gets done and it's all like proofread. That's that's the stuff that kills me. <laughs> Especially like yeah, going, yeah, going back and seeing you made like a mistake in a video that you've already rendered. That's like oh no. <laughs> One of the novels that I put out last year. Um, love match i've i'm serializing on patreon so there's a bunch of people who see the parts before they go live and sometimes they point out things to me like hey wasn't this character a rabbit before and now he's a cougar um but uh one of the things that made it past them past my proofreading passes past my editor's proofreading passes (laughs) um was that i so the, these all occur in the out of position world in which I made the stupid decision early on that I wasn't going to use real world names for things, but I was going to make up my own names for things. Yeah. Um, so there's one instance in Love Match where I accidentally wrote Florida instead of um, whatever I call it in Love Match. I think Pensa is what I call it. But um, so I accidentally wrote Florida and that's, still in there it's in all the print editions that are out oh no <laughs> uh, yeah i was like even after years of doing this these things still slip through and there's there's nothing wrong i think that's almost kind of charming in a way that you can look back and be like i made this mistake i'm never gonna make it again <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask i guess more more expounding on the whole audible situation like uh mm-hmm. what kind of opportunities came about as as uh, you continue to do this writing because i'm sure you you started meeting more people who had like similar you know talents or other people who were trying to find businesses around this sort of thing um one of the neat things about writing is that it gave me the chance to work with not just other writers but also publishers and artists so i try to get art for all my books that's a that's a thing that the furry fandom has firmly established as a standard for for its books and actually my friends in the science fiction community have said a couple times like man i want to i want to get a book published with one of your furry presses just so i can get interior art for it because like nowhere else in the world do people have interior illustrations showing their characters and all that stuff for their books and my my friend non-furry friends are jealous of my uh of the artwork in the books. Audible was cool. I connected with a guy who just does audiobooks in his spare time, but he's also really good. And he did the books for all of the Dangerous Spirits series, uh, Green Fairy and Red Devil and Black Angel. 
there's a kind of thing, and you're experiencing this also, where when you're creating something in the fandom, it becomes easier. That's like a, a kind of barrier to entry to get other creators to talk to you. Oh, yeah. Like, like um, when, when you create something, it, it kind of almost brings other people in your direction as a magnet. Yeah. You know, I met Fox Amore when I was a guest of honor at Confuzzled. You know, we just we just hit it off. And I had ordered a commission from him like a few years before, but I didn't realize that that's who that was until we'd been talking for a half an hour. <laughs> and he didn't realize who I was until we'd been talking, but we were, we just hung out. And then when we figured out, oh, you're the one who writes this book. Oh, you're the one who writes the music. And, and we're like, oh, that's so cool. But also, as you said, the, the creators in the fandom are, are very accessible to everyone. Like Fox hangs out at his... Um, conventions and his table and he'll chat with everyone who comes up to the table i guess one of the things that happened was actually in spaces outside the fandom uh where i talked about going to science fiction conventions and i've gotten at least i got a membership to the science fiction writers uh association based on sales of one of my furry books so that was kind of cool I was going to get into creating characters because that's something I've noticed. Like you do really well with your with your novel, at least at least the one I'm into right mm, now. Thank you. I feel very um, very interested in the way you display different characters and, and how they they convey themselves. And you're kind of on about like how you want to put that into a story. The whole like idea of being a programmer or like you know just being very despondent with what you're doing. Could you could you maybe elaborate more on what makes a good character, at least in your book? I see what you did there. Uh, <clears throat> a good a good character is someone, and man, you know, people ask this question all the time, and I'll give different answers every time, but I think there's a core that's similar. Um, a good character is one that is relatable, not necessarily because you're thinking, oh, man, that person's exactly like me. But because you're thinking, oh, I get why they're behaving that way in this situation. Yeah, just based on um, how they've been, you know, throughout their entire lives and how, how they've sort of interacted with people. Part of how that happens is in details. And those are the, these are things we latch on to. You know, if, if you ask someone who was at a, a wedding, for example, like an important event. I was trying to think of a happy important event. <laughs> Um, as someone who was at a wedding, like, what do you, what do you remember about the wedding? So there's this one wedding that I went to, I'm like, what do you remember about it? And I say, you know, what I remember is the wedding was in this old church. It was way too small for the number of people who were there. And it was summer. And I remember being enclosed by stone crowded with a bunch of people with a beam kind of blocking my view of what was happening and sweating in the suit that I had. Oh no. And um but if you're but if you're thinking, oh, I want to describe this person's experience at the wedding, you're like, oh, and they went to a wedding and there was a bride and a groom and they said their vows and it was very, you know, and you but that's not necessarily like I don't remember anything about what the bride and groom said during that <laughs> wedding. But man, I can still picture sitting there in that tiny stone church and also taking a picture and discovering that I had not turned off the shutter sound on the phone or digital camera or whatever it was that I had. And so it made a noise and I was very embarrassed by that. It's picking up. So just from that story, you, you get more of a sense of who I was at that time, what I was going through. These are the things that I focused on creating a relatable character in a lot of ways comes down to uh, what details in their lives do they focus on? How do they focus on them? And what are their reactions to them? You know, if you if you want hints on that, start by looking around at all of the people you deal with in your daily life. Think about how they react to things differently than you react to things. What are what are the things that distinguish you from them? If you say, oh, you know, my roommate and I, if we if we go down and we want a bowl of cereal and then there's no milk in the fridge. Uh, my roommate will say, well, all right, I'm going to run down to the store and I'll get some milk and then I'll come back and I'll have my cereal. And I will 
you know, go through the cupboard and find an old box of stale Ritz crackers and just take half of a package of them and have that instead of my cereal because it's, it's too much. Or I don't want to like, I don't want to be bothered. <laughs> um, and those are, those are two very different people. So, you know, just, just as an example, those are ways you can define characters through interaction with your environment and your setting also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I was, I was even going to talk about story and setting, but like a lot of it, I think is is very similar in terms of how how you explained it. Where you uh, take personal experiences or even your connections to certain settings, uh, whether it's like through actual experience or like your kind of understanding of it. I, I feel like it's it's a lot of it comes from real life. A lot of it does, and <clears throat> a lot of it is sort of extrapolating from real life. I've I've never been in the situation that a lot of the people in my books are in. I spend a lot of time thinking, okay, if I were in that situation, how would I react? Or how would this friend of mine react? Okay, now how would these characters react? And the more you think about them as, you know, what if these characters were friends of mine? How would they deal with these things? I think the more real they become. Kind of funny, there's a more modern sort of uh, twist on that. Um, people posting their life stories on reddit and like just confessionals and all sorts of weird stuff like you can you can see into so many different people's lives and whether or not you're like how does this person exist or why does this person exist (laughs) you suddenly get an idea for for what potentially could make a really interesting character even if you don't agree with their beliefs or their their ideas like that that could be a good starting point for for like the uh, conflict in a story yeah absolutely with with story, how would you say you structure it? Like, do you start with a beginning and an end, or like, is it you just kind of have an idea, then you like kind of expand it from there? Most of the time, my stories tend to be focused around character. I will start with this is a story about you know, for example, waterways because I, I just read through that again, so that one's fresh in my mind. <laughs> waterways is about a kid in high school who falls in love with a another guy and has to ask himself, wait, what does this mean about my identity? And then what does this mean about my interactions with my family? And then what does this mean about my place in the world and my place in society? And so I knew when I started that I wanted him to be in a, in kind of a space where he was just accepting everything that society told him about himself and about what he had to do. And he was kind of just cruising through life. And eventually what he was going to learn was that he has agency. To go back to that word. It's a great word. Um, <laughs> he has agency and can make a decision that points him towards a more realized version of himself. And then you go back and you say, okay, well, change is really difficult. So um, you have to bring a lot of pressure on a character to actually make a significant change in their life. So what kind of things can happen so that he will have enough pressure that he will be forced to make this change and realize um, how he wants to, to, you know, be happier with his life. And then, and then you start breaking it down and structuring a plot and, and you bring in, you know, side characters and supporting characters. And you, you might say, oh, well, you know, here's a character who's going through similar things, but they make the opposite decision. Or here's a character who's already made this decision and you put them in as foils to kind of push the main character one way or another. And, and I, at some point, you know, I'll have an outline and I'll say these are the kinds of things that happen. But when I actually start writing, discovering the story with the character as they go through it, and a lot of times it changes, almost all the time it changes from the outline or the planning that I had done for it. So, so would you also say that with, with an ending, do you always try to find like a very satisfactory sort of conclusion or like, is, is it more you want to keep things open for potential sequels? Uh, endings are, endings are super important to me. And I have, I have actually been uh, very disappointed in books that were fine up until a certain point and then had a terrible ending and, and I'm like, I'm uh, done with you. <laughs> um, I don't usually think about sequels necessarily. Like if there's the potential for another story, then I will be thinking about it. It'll happen and so on. What the ending has to do is resolve the issue that you 
started the character with. Waterways starts with a kid saying, hey, is it okay for me to be gay? Is it okay for me to be in this gay relationship? And it ends with him making a decision about, is it okay for him to be in this gay relationship? Um, given the number of people who have written to ask me if I'm going to write a sequel, clearly most people don't think that's the end of their story, but it was the end of that story because that was the question that was posed in the beginning. But one of the things that has been really cool uh, is my Patreon because I'm posting a work in progress. I post a segment from the ongoing novel series Love Match every week. And it's, and usually, you know, I have hundred some patrons and usually about two to six will comment on each part, depending on what happens. Like for a really heavy part, I'll get a lot of comments, but there's a couple people who will just write down their impressions to let me know that they're still into it, which is, which is pretty cool. And people will be like, ah, this was great. Now, I now what's going to happen next? Or this is what I think is going to happen next. And it's, it's nice to have that feedback while I'm while I'm writing the story. It's at least a a kind of a way for the fans to keep you company. Uh, the other thing is that there's the Furry Writing Guild, as I've mentioned, and also I have a couple um, groups of writers, and we talk about the things we're, we're working on all the time. I have a writing group that meets every other week. And we sit down and say, "Ah, oh, I'm working on this novel. It's going really slowly or uh, someone will say, Hey, I have an idea for a story, but I don't think it's completely working yet. Can I talk it through with you guys? And we'll talk through the ideas and stuff. And um, having that kind of support network, even if it isn't specifically social media is, um, is pretty cool. Yeah. I, I was talking with Tess earlier on, on their talk. Um, they, they actually mentioned the sort of personal disdain for when they were doing uh, graphic novels, cause they sort of crave that interaction with, with people. And I think what, what you're saying is actually a really great way of kind of evening out the difference between the two where like you're actually interacting, but maybe it's not the final product. I think, I think it's a little harder with a uh, comic. Sometimes the rust will look completely different from like what the uh, actual finished thing is, is going to be. But I mean, it's just, I'm assuming it's the same with like what, what you're posting it ends up getting changed a decent amount anyways. Um, sometimes uh, I write, I write pretty clean first drafts. So um, I just went through and did some edits on the second love match volume that's coming out. And I didn't, didn't change all that much. I, added some things here and there. I cleaned up the pros because I always clean up the pros. But but I didn't make huge wholesale changes to the story. Usually by the time I get through a first draft, because I'm thinking as I'm writing it, like, does this, does this make sense as an overall story? And if I start going into a direction that doesn't, I'll have to go back and change some stuff. Um, Love Match is very episodic. So that works better as the the Patreon thing. I just have to keep in mind what the overall arc of the story is. And then each individual arc, I can keep pretty stable from first draft to publication. I guess speaking of Tess, and you kind of also uh, ring this back in by bringing up Foxamore. Uh, I noticed you collaborate with uh, other artists, whether they're, they're publishing like uh, art alongside your books or in, in your books rather. And uh, also, I, I haven't heard the song personally, but somebody was bringing up about the uh, whole Foxamore um, doing a song with Pepper Coyote uh, about your book. Could could you explain mm -hmm. like, maybe what that kind of experience is for you and why why you enjoy that? It's it's weird because I like working with other creative people. I mean, and I love obviously I love writing my own books and stories and stuff too. I have tried to collaborate with other writers, and that usually has well. In the past, I can't think of a way of a time that that ended up actually working out, apart from you know shared worlds or anthologies where everyone goes off and does their own story and then we collect them all. Yeah, it's really cool with artists and the way that I'll usually work on a book. If the artist wants to read the book, which usually they do, I'll I'll give them an early copy somewhere early in the editing process and say, you know, go ahead and read the book and then we'll we'll have a discussion and I try to let them start the discussion by asking them what scenes jumped out at you. 
and hopefully there's hopefully there's enough scenes in there to fill you know the quote of illustrations for a book <laughs> um my my favorite thing that uh tess said to me actually she read the first out of position book um prior to doing some of the illustrations for it she happened to be traveling somewhere at the time and it was fall so it was football season oh man and she was she was reading the football stuff in the book and she said i uh i read your book and i i was really excited about football i thought it was a really interesting game and so i actually stopped and watched some in the on the tv in the airport and i discovered that it's actually dull and boring and your book is full of lies (laughs) (laughs) football is an interesting topic because i i am so mixed between it i uh, have a family who very much loves it they're new york giants uh all the way woo but um, oh i'm sorry for your loss this year oh god no it's so bad don't even get started like it's it's (laughs) but they've been they've been on a losing streak ever since they won a few years back it's it's been crazy but that being said, uh, football, I think, is best enjoyed when you have people who uh, sort of appreciate it a little bit more than you do. And, and you can relate to them through that. And in, in whether or not you enjoy the game, which I think the game's pretty cool. It's not the best thing in the world to me, but I, I definitely appreciate like how, how much you know, passion people have for it, whether you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. about the sports or whatever. It's, it's just great. It's, it's the same way that I can relate to other people within the furry fandom, at least me personally. No, it's very similar. No, we, we used to have discussions back in the day and still kind of do about how furry fandom is very similar to a sports fandom. You have these imaginary, well, real people, but you're not, you're not really a fan of the real people. You're a fan of these imaginary constructs that are based on the real people. You sometimes go out and dress up like them you are unreasonably attached to them and <laughs> <clears throat> you know there's there there's a lot of similarities but sports fandom is accepted in the mainstream because you know everyone does it and sports are super popular it's been established too, um, for a while like i mean not yeah that furries have it but football is just so like anybody can access it right and you know for for a while like growing up, I was much more a baseball fan and I kind of fell away from that. And a friend of mine explained football to me in college. And that explanation has kind of made its way into the out of position books where uh, one of, I think Lee's guide to football at least incorporates a bunch of elements from what the way my friend explained it to me, which was the first time I started actually appreciating it as a game. Uh, but but that kind of brings me back to the whole like you making a novel not only centered about a gay romance but maybe engaging people in something else they might not have considered which is football. And, like, <laughs> I was thinking a few chapters in like when you were just like talking uh, when when Lee had that whole discussion about like relating football to chess and kind of explained I'm like this guy is just trying to make people like football I'm like what is this? Like? <laughs> I've gotten a bunch of um, letters. Uh, my favorite one went something like. Uh, I hate football, but I hate it less after reading your book. <laughs> and other people have said uh, more kind of more touching things like, you know, my family was really into football and I never got it. I never understood it. But now I've read your books and now I can sit down and at least like I I understand what's going on and I can like hang out with my family during football games now. With with uh, the way you explained it, it's like a, a lot of people like to look at football and they, they think of it as a very like, this is unrelatable. It's just sports dudes butting heads against each other and people drinking beer and, and excessively spending money on like, you know, NFL players. And it's like you think about the fandom and there's people who spend lots of money on fursuits and art and all the other things that, that surround like just supporting it. And it's like you were talking about how they're very similar but also like very set apart i just think it's in a situation where you can appreciate someone else's love of something without necessarily being like a huge fan and i think that really kind of makes it a very good stepping ground for for getting into it you know at least for yeah me, exactly when, when i got into football it was it was purely just to to put up with the other people who loved it that much and i kind of sort of <laughs> started to love it myself like after after seeing why they loved it so much you know yeah it's it's hard especially when you're going to the games live it's hard not to get caught up in the in the crowd like everybody is so invested putting so much energy into this 
Um, and it's fun. It's great to, to be part of that, even going out to a bar. Yeah, and it's, it's like something, this is really dumb, but like back when I used to work at a grocery store, like probably five, six years ago, they, uh, they let us, the only thing we were allowed to do outside of uniform was they would let us wear jerseys every single Sunday. And of course, my mom was quick to get me the, the New York Giants jersey. And suddenly I'm feeling a lot more passionate. Which, which player? Um, Ma- Eli Manning. I don't know why I was forgetting his name. Like, I know the Giants, like, not inside and out, but I definitely <laughs> know them. You know, it was, it was Eli Manning when he was, like, super in his prime. And I think we actually won the game that year. But um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was cool, like, being able to sort of identify with other people without necessarily, like, you know, being 100% into it. And that sort of kind of pushed me in, in the direction of why I love football so much, you know? Yeah, and that's kind of, that gets back to like the very beginning when we were talking about what's cool about the furry fandom, and it's that same kind of shared love of a thing underlies it. Like we might, you know, I might run into someone at a con, and they might be a, um, I don't know, a software engineer for a big tech company in Texas somewhere, and you know, I'm a writer who lives in the California Bay Area, but I know, I don't necessarily know what animal it is, although if it's at a convention, I can see it on their badge probably. Yeah. Um, but I know like, hey, you like furry stuff. I like furry stuff. We have at least, you know, that much in common. All right. So this this brings us to the social media section. I was I was going to ask you some questions maybe because you, since you've been in, in the fandom for a while, maybe you've noticed a lot of changes ever since. Like, I guess both in the rep and also just how people are interacting and how conventions are sort of growing. Because Tess also was in the same kind of spot where they said your reference was like a few park benches and like some people hanging around like, you know, together doing art. But now your reference is like just this big colossal entity that everybody goes to now. Um, what, oh, yeah. What would you say uh, has, has been your experience with social media over the last, uh, you know, few years seeing it change the fandom? Man, social media is it's it's interesting to watch where people go um most of my interactions with other furries on social media of any kind are on twitter um i have a facebook profile i have a facebook author page i think mostly it's set up to get entries from my blog although that also might have broken but it, basically i don't check facebook very often oh, me neither. um and and that's not it doesn't seem to be a place where a lot of furries gather um they tend to be they tend to be mostly on twitter that i've seen like one of my one of my friends um talks about oh you know there's furry twitter and there's there's football sports twitter and football twitter and and whatnot but there's also subgroups so there's like furry writer twitter and these communities kind of form organically based on people following uh, a similar group of people. And the, the funny thing is there's, there are some species Twitters for sure. Uh, there's not a Fox Twitter because I think there's too many Foxes, yeah. but there's definitely coyote Twitter and cheetah Twitter and uh, otter Twitter. Um, I, I wrote a book with a cheetah main character last year and it was brief. There was a brief little flare when cheetah Twitter noticed it. And you're like, I have to tell all these other people about it. And it's been, it's been funny to watch the, like the development of these little groups and how they form on, on social media. If you saw Vin Carly, um, I guess Tess might've talked to you a yes. little bit about this. They, that blew up, and then suddenly, like, the little bubble of, like, people who identify with, like, Border Collies and, like, you know, that stuff there, they're like, oh, we need to talk about this. Who's who's this Vin Collie person? Why do they exist? Where are they? You know? <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Like, that really opened my eyes in terms of, like, these little Twitter biomes that just sort of pop up, like, almost seamlessly with everything else. Like, I never knew that happened, and that, that was just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that there was a Border Collie Twitter, but that makes total sense. Yeah. You talked about like AOL Instant Messenger, which I, I think I read a headline today that they're like decommissioning it finally. Oh my god. Um it's been it's been dying for years and years. I used to hang out on AIM all day and like all my friends contact list basically, you know, what we now use Telegram for because it has cute stickers. <laughs> but Twitter has kind of replaced AIM and Furry Muck to some extent. 
because you're still, you know, on Twitter, you have your, your icon. So you're still kind of playing your character and just having conversations. And that's all we did on Furry Muck back in the day. It's, it's interesting, kind of tangentially. I was talking to someone we met at Comic-Con who was interested in the whole furry phenomenon. He, we, we exchanged some emails and he said, so like, tell me why you have an animal icon. And I just thought, I was like, wow, that, that really gets at the heart of what furry fandom is. Like, <laughs> why do we represent ourselves an animal person icon on Twitter? And so I went into this whole thing about, um, you know, this is people identify with it. It's this whole kind of, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? And then we just kind of like really put a lot of thought into that question. It's interesting that that social media has kind of become a very public display of, of furry fandom. So like, you know, I say there's furry Twitter, but at the same time, anyone in the world can figure out some accounts to follow and can access furry Twitter. Like for example, um, Boozy Badger recently, the lawyer who, got introduced to the fandom via the, the RMFC debacle that happened um, earlier this summer, discovered that all of these people with animal icons were tweeting at him and, and saying, that was really cool what you did. And he was like, what is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and now he's more or less assimilated. But, and I think it's helped a lot as the other thing that you were talking about with the reputation. Many of our interactions are just all out in public. Mm-hmm. And people go look them up and they're like, oh, these are these are just normal people having normal conversations while pretending to be animal people. Well, that's not weird. I mean, it's weird, but it's yeah. not <laughs> super weird. And more and more like I, you know, I lived through the days where there was the you know very old time furries will remember the Wired article where they talked about furry muck and they basically said, it's just a place for people to get together and pretend to be animals having sex. Oh. What has happened now is that furry has grown so much and the internet has become so pervasive. You know, for a while there was, there was the, you know, the something awful period. And the, I think they got bored of that because oh, there was, yeah. that's, that's the end. There's no, there's no continuation to that quote unquote joke coming to furry cons, seeing what happens at cons so, so the last few years, I've seen several articles to the effect of, hey, I went to a furry con, and you know what? Everyone's super nice. <laughs> well, I, so the way I, I, I kind of relate to it is I, my, my first impressions of the community, I guess, was from reading through some of the Encyclopedia Dramatica articles. There are some very mean things that have been said about some prevalent content creators. I'm not going to get into But a lot of these people who used to be, like, very – pervasive on the front of wanting to make people feel uncomfortable about being furries are now furries and <laughs> <laughs> they were closeted they were they were like trying to you know try to get the heat off themselves and so they wrote these articles and i i wasn't one of those i was more in the line of like haha yeah furries are dumb but secretly in the inside i was dying you know waiting to, <laughs> waiting to do my own thing which is why you know i just joined the fandom because it was like for years and years i was dealing with people who just told me a lot of very unflattering things about like people who were furries who they knew through like their cousin or something and it's like furries do this or this and it's like no a lot of my interactions with furries are very pleasant and you know the the ones that i would say are unsavory are far and in between or there are people who you know you would normally deal with anywhere else outside of the fandom but i, I yeah. definitely think the image has improved dramatically from from the days of the strategically placed whole couple (laughs) that was was a very different time compared to now before before we get to the q a i wanted to touch on how you uh i I guess projects that you might be working on in the future and you mentioned the uh the waterways like revival just like a few edits is there anything else big that you might want to mention that you're working on or is it like all top secret quote unquote i'll do a, a quick little plug i have a newsletter that goes out monthly where i tell people these are the things that i'm working on and here's one. Like the last newsletter actually involved me sitting down and because I had to do this anyway, thinking about what am I what are the books that I'm going to write next year. 
So I'm pretty open about it. Um, where I tend to play it close to the vest is in uh, announcing release dates because the slight downside of working with artists, which you know is completely outweighed by the fact that you, they make amazing art and they're all pretty cool people um, who are, like, I think most of the people who have done art for my books, I would now also consider friends as well as um, colleagues. But the downside is that sometimes things happen. And, and, you know, at this point I have, you know, the 10th edition or the 10th anniversary of Waterways ready um, to go to be out by the MFF deadline. You know, in a typical novel, we'll be getting a cover and we'll getting a, be getting a bunch of interiors. And, you know, stuff might happen with the artist and we might have to push the deadline back. So I tend I tend not to be firm about what dates things are coming out until I'm much more certain that it's going to to work because I I hate to tell people, oh, it's going to be out at this thing and then have to say, actually, we have to move it back a couple months. Oh, that always feels terrible, man. So I mentioned uh, Love Match, my ongoing Patreon story. The first volume of that came out this year. The second volume will be out next year. I just went through and edited it, and I'm sending it out to people for feedback and, you know, just needs a cover and some art. I'm working on a series that the first book came out this year uh, called The Collations. The first book was The Tower and the Fox. That was actually released under my real name because it's slightly more it's more mainstreamy fantasy <laughs> also the science fiction community half of half of them know me under my real name because i've had a few stories published so it's nice to now go to these conventions and when people say what have you written i'm like oh here's this thing um because i tell them about the stuff that i've written as kyle but when you're when you're meeting someone and and they say oh and i write stuff for this community as this person there's a distance there and so they're much less inclined to go investigate and pick it up unless you know i'm more aggressive about it which i tend not to like to be <laughs> so having something under my real name is nice and then i you know went out on facebook because i'm more active on facebook as my under my real name because i have family and college friends and whatnot and i was like i have a book and it was funny because i talk about the fact that I have this other identity that writes all these books, but I was writing this one under my own name and people were coming back with like, Oh, that's so cool. I'm so proud of you. This feels, this must be a great accomplishment. Cause I'm like, this is like my 24th book, but, but <laughs> sure. Right. Um, so the second one of that is written and will be out next year. Um, one of the books I have to write next year is the third one, um, which I have plotted kind of, uh, but that's fun. It's like it's a fantasy series. There's magic it takes place in the early 1800s when the American Revolution has not quite yet happened. Um, but there are animal people who were created by magic and they're basically trying to be recognized as equal citizens in the world. That's really cool. And so there's a lot of stuff in that book about your responsibility to parental in some ways but the but the parental metaphor expanded out to you know we created these animal people for magic so what are our responsibilities to them and there's also the colonial aspect which is why the american revolution comes into it as you know the parent country created this colony which is sort of like a child and what are your responsibilities towards your political children and oh, yeah. your and so on so i'm i'm trying to like hit all of those themes with that series uh, it's just been a lot of fun to write. The Out of Position series has been ended, but I'm writing another book with those characters that takes place like some eight years later. Um, so nice. a little more, a little closer to the present day. So I'll probably be writing that in the next few months with an eye to getting it out maybe fall of next year or early 2019 that's actually really good i had somebody asking about that specifically they're like hey so you're gonna do more out of position books but um <laughs> so it's q a section uh basically kyle's fans or fans of me or the podcast basically ask some some cool stuff and i got some really good questions this time so i'm very sorry if you didn't get in here so i guess i guess i wanted to start um with uh yinabu on twitter in fa uh, mm -hmm. so kyle 
How does it feel to know that your work has been praised as formative in helping many fans accept their sexuality? Reading Out of Position helped me understand that being gay wasn't just about the sex, but rather loving someone regardless of gender or social norms. I do hear, uh, I get, you know, emails about that from time to time. I always try to remind people that, you know, the, the books might have shown them the path, but they're the ones who took the steps. So I'm, I'm really glad that the books have helped and I'm really proud of everyone who, who actually followed the, the feelings that they got from the book to make changes in their life and, um, and, 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 put themselves in a happier place as it were, because that's hard work. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be the guy, you know, holding the flashlight in the darkness. Um, but, uh, but you guys, you guys are the ones walking forward and good, good for all of you. Oh. <laughs> so would you say that that has uh, impacted the way that you write your stories? Do you keep it in mind that you might be aiding some people with that sort of uh, problem? Uh, a, a little bit um, in, in a way it almost it almost works in the opposite direction because now I feel like well you know waterways and the outer position books are out there for people with that problem so I, I what other problems might people be having that my characters could help help them with oh, man. Um, green fairy was partly uh, partly came about because I wanted some way to, to tell people to be careful of relationships you get into over the internet and that people aren't always the people they represent themselves as. And it's not, I mean, to be, to be charitable on the, on, you know, one extreme, it is about honesty and or dishonesty and misrepresenting yourself. But I think there's also just the, the, the way that that communication works over the internet is you are, specifically choosing what you want the other person to see. And there may not be intentional dishonesty in it. It may just be, well, I only get online when I'm in a happy mood and I'm, you know, I'm happy to see this person because we only get to see each other every, every other day or every week or whatnot. But then when you move in and they're there every day, you can't filter your interactions that way. And so you know, people, people have different moods at different times of the day. And sometimes you have bad moods and, you know, how do you deal with that when there's someone around all the time, when they're not just on the computer, when you specifically want to see them. I do think it's cool that you're trying to kind of convey a message to people, maybe whether it's, it's through expressing themselves or, or uh, just keeping an eye open for, for, you know, potential disasters ahead. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Kogawa Kenshi from Twitter and other places possibly, uh, they they say, I'd read a lot of the stories that have anthropomorphic uh, characters, but most of them rarely used parts of the body for movement other than the face or expression to present emotion. Uh, the mood characteristics, the, the kind of the way the ears stand and the muzzles twitch. How would you say you convey this idea and like why, why do you do it so naturally? Part of it is... I think spent a lot of time working with animal behavior and kind of decoding animal behavior and because animals can't tell you why they're doing a thing, you have to, you know, think about it and be able to decode um, what they mean. But also, you know, just from, from watching animals, from watching the way they communicate, uh, there's a great book about another book about foxes called running with the Fox, where he talked about vocalizations and, um, attitude and uh, and so on. And also, you know, I grew up with a dog. And so dogs have expressive ears and um, expressive body language. And so you you sort of put all of this together and you kind of imagine how would how how would furries communicate if you know if you're a fox and you have these big triangular stand up ears, <laughs> um, there's uh, there's a great video of a fox like trying to steal some cat food from a back porch at night and the cats are there. And so the fox is like creeping up to it and then and his ears come up and then the cats move towards him and his ears flip back right away. And it's just it's really cool. And, you know, you people communicate with 
body language, like we communicate with eyebrows and our lips and smile and kind of the way we turn and so on. And if we had, <clears throat> if we had ears, if we had whiskers that could like fluff up when we smiled or, um, you know, we would absolutely be using those as cues. And so I imagine the characters when I'm writing, having these reactions and it just, it feels, it feels natural at this point. That's cool. And in fact, one like slight side note, when I started writing that collation series, it was very weird for me to write humans. I never tried to say about a human character, uh, he flicked his ears back or anything like that. <laughs> it was just weird because they were different in my mind and I was aware that that wasn't an option. Well, maybe in some cases, but, <laughs> um, but it, yeah, I, so I had to have develop or, you know, access this different vocabulary for how human facial expressions work, which I hadn't really written about in a long time. I've, I've read a lot of things like he wrinkled his brow or he like or furrowed his brow and wrinkled his nose and like the way his uh, cheeks puffed out or something like I used to do a lot of reading when it came to, uh, I guess, I don't want to say fiction. It was it was like young people fiction. Like I read the Artemis Fowl books and I read the uh, series of unfortunate events, stuff like that. And that every oh, those about. are great. <laughs> They're great. They have so much like expression and character behind them. And Artemis Fowl, like oh my god, I could geek about that for like a minute. But like <laughs> those those I haven't read. But we went through all the unfortunate events series on audiobook actually. Yeah, and and I, I think when it's it, they're actually very similar to you, where you said like not a lot of artists get to have or not a lot of uh, writers get to have. Uh, illustrations in their books they worked very closely with one illustrator i think they actually redid the illustrations recently and not as many people liked them but it was a it was it was really cool getting to see like the way they described these characters and the way they reacted to things but also you got to see them in these perilous events and you're like oh man this is like sick <laughs> but uh I, yeah. I do i do like yeah. that you you can take a lot of uh inspiration from the way that animals actually act uh in real life because i feel like that adds so much more to to the characters whether or not they're anthro i think this is kind of a side note but one of the funniest things i read for some of the reviews for your books was just like i'm not really into anthro characters but this is one of the best gay novels i've read and it was just like <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird because you have so much in there that makes it very clear that they're all animals and it's like something that not a lot of people who would not consider themselves furry, I guess they would notice it immediately. And, like, there's classic, you know, stuff that, that's written for anthropomorphic characters, but not necessarily in the same sense that you do it. So it's, like, cool that you can link that to an audience who's maybe not familiar with all of these sorts of animal characteristics. Yeah, I think my favorite review along those lines was someone who wrote, it should be weird, it should be gross, but somehow it's not. <laughs> That's great, man. No, that's that's kind of cool. Like, I like it when you can get positive press um, for for the furry fandom while being porn, because that's something I actually want to get into a little bit later with my series. But um, yeah. I'm going to go on to the last question we have for tonight. It's uh, Kuroda Fox from Twitter. They asked, okay. I guess we were talking about this earlier, about the whole uh, Fox and Moore and Pepper Coyote collaboration. They did a song about your book, Out of Position, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. Were you involved in this? Yes. Yeah, 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 I was involved. They uh, Fox had been bugging me for a while and and then came to me with this idea where he was like, I want to write a song about out of position. Is that cool? And I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, and so he had come up with the, the music and um, Pepper was working on the lyrics. And so Pepper asked me for just like quotes from the books or words from the books. And so I wrote down a bunch that I remembered off the top of my head. And then I asked a bunch of fans on Twitter for some more. Um, so fans on Twitter who responded to that, uh, you also are part of writing this song. <laughs> but, um, but then basically I just like, I sent Pepper a whole bunch of words and he came back with this pretty beautiful song. And I think I only made one suggestion which was to add the line at the very very end of the song and he was like yeah that's a good suggestion <laughs> so so that was it so that was the extent of my involvement i wrote the books and then i sent him some of the words from the books and then they made a song how did it feel like uh, having somebody say i i liked your book so much or your series so much that they they wanted to make a uh, product based off of that I mean that that's always 
that's always amazing. Like I want it the same the same thing. Anything that inspires people. Um, like I said earlier, like the best compliment is when somebody reads the books and says, "You made me want to write." Um, <laughs> whether that's another book or write a song or draw a picture like fan I've, I've gotten some amazing fan art from, from all of the books actually. Um, and you know, anytime someone's inspired because I know time is so precious for all of us right now. Um, that just someone who took the time to read a book, that's great. <laughs> but then to want to spend more of their time and energy and, you know, put it into some creative venture um, because the book had that effect on them, you you know, that's really cool. And it takes me back because when I was growing up, I did a bunch of different things, um, you know, mostly science fiction and fantasy, but not exclusively. And man, I like, if I could, if I had, been able to draw back in those days i would have been drawing fan art for a bunch of these books um there were books that i read that i that i didn't want to end i wrote um like little terrible fan fiction tribute things to books and so so i identify with that feeling and so what that tells me is man i gave someone else that feeling um and since that was basically like my best feeling when reading a book that makes me really really happy closing out the podcast i I just wanted to ask you if you had any last uh feelings about it or like any of the stuff you wanted to say to your fans uh no the podcast has been great thank you so much for inviting me um this has been a lot of fun um i am definitely want to like chat with you about lemony snicket and bojack horseman (laughs) and other stuff um at some point in the future definitely man um just like you know this i i say to my fans all the time like you guys you guys are awesome keep being keep being awesome thank you for support on twitter and elsewhere and patreon all the patreon guys are great no it's just it's it's one of the things that the 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 fans and the support that i've gotten has is is really what allows me to do the thing that I love full time all the time. And so I owe them this great debt every time I, every day when I sit down in front of my computer and I think this is my job, it's because of the fans. It's because of the people who support me and enable me to do it, Um, you know, in a financial sense, realistically, but also in an emotional sense, you know, I get getting the letters from people, getting tweets every now and then someone tweeted just the other day, like, randomly oh i think about kyle gold and how much i love his books and you know that's that kind of stuff makes it uh makes it possible for me to to have this kind of amazing life that i feel super lucky to have so the fans are great uh, I was trying to say is like I just don't think I've ever seen like such a positive response to someone on the show. I mean, I've only had it out for a few episodes now, but like the amount of appreciation I've seen for your work, whether it's through my own Discord uh, chat or the um, people who responded via the questions on the Google Docs, uh, it's it's ridiculous. Like I, I think people really respect your work, and I think that's a really great position to be in. So like, I <laughs> just keep doing what you're doing. Apparently, you're doing a very good thing. Well, thank you. I I hope so, and. I'm glad that people have stuck with me through um, writing books about football and ghosts and tennis and whatever else. So more, more good stuff to come. I think, I think uh, with the Patreon thing, I don't know a lot of content creators who offer something that close and personal. Some people do PDFs of their art, but like seeing a novel, especially like one that's going to be published uh, in, in a sort of, closed environment before anything else that's a really good deal so i would go definitely check that out <laughs> you know? that's, that's cool well, thanks okay so i guess i guess on that note thanks for tuning in to uh this week's podcast i i definitely appreciate all the great stuff that kyle said and uh i haven't mentioned this before but i actually have a discord that i uh typically people can go into and if they want to have art discussions or post their own stuff or maybe interact with some of the guests on the show i actually have have a whole discord server set up for that so look down in the description below you'll totally get that if you like this stuff 
Uh, like, comment, like, subscribe, whatever, all that cool stuff. Um, thanks for tuning in. It's been a great uh, talk, and I hope you have a good one. Bye, everyone.